some point we all have to choose between what the world wants you to be and who you are. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy and we're going to talk to you about why Robert Downey Jr. as Doctor Doom is actually the perfect choice to end the multiverse saga and how this is the perfect capstone to a saga that has been all about choice. Now, on the surface, the multiverse saga seems extremely disorganized. What do you mean? Well, I mean, think about it. In the Infinity Saga, we had, like, franchises within the greater MCU franchise. The series was anchored by trilogies from Thor, Captain America, and Iron Man, as well as newer franchises like Doctor Strange, Spider-Man, and the Guardians of the Galaxy. The ongoing stories of these characters created a foundation that went through this entire narrative. Steve and Tony were at the center of this story. But in the multiverse saga, characters have been reintroduced Reduced and then seemingly abandoned, like Shang-Chi. There are so many plates spinning right now that it seems like it takes forever to get any kind of follow-through on a story. Tiamat's been sticking out of the Indian Ocean for three years now. Not to mention all these fun post-credits teases like Blade and Hercules that have yet to pay off. And there has been a lack of any Avengers film to unite any of these franchises together. So, as I said, it feels disorganized. Jeez, point taken. Don't gotta bite my head off about it. But here's the thing, Doug. Actually, when you take a step back, all of these movies and TV shows are united by a single theme choice. And all credit to our own Colton Ogburn for articulating this idea in our Robert Downey Jr. reaction video. Colton gave an eloquent response about why this theme makes Robert Downey Jr. the perfect choice to play Doom, which I'll discuss in just a bit. So why does the multiverse saga gotta have a theme? They didn't have a theme in the Infinity Saga. Oh yes they did. The theme in the Infinity Saga was found families. Although I don't think they mapped out the theme at the start. MCU movies picked up this template from Iron Man, which focused on Tony's loneliness and isolation. He lost his parents and almost lost his life, so he slowly pulls Pepper and Rhodey into his circle of trust. After all, at the beginning of the third act, it's Pepper's sentimentality and connection that saves Tony's life when he uses his old arc reactor. But Marvel characters, like most superheroes, all have similar backstories that played naturally into this theme. Steve Rogers had no family, and then he was abandoned in the future where everyone he knew was dead. This is why he sought a found family, the Avengers. People try to say that the MCU is filled with daddy issues, which not wrong, but the reason everyone has daddy issues is because the heroes' home lives need to be dysfunctional, because then the heroes will search for a found family. Thor has problems at home, so he finds Jane, Eric, and Darcy, and later Korg and Valkyrie. This eventually causes Thor to reshape his idea of what home and family means, and the Hulk was rejected by society. So all of these Avengers needed each other, and that is why they chose to assemble. I could keep going. Ant-Man is about Scott being rejected from his family, so he seeks a new found family, and the Guardians of the Galaxy Galaxy are like the ultimate found family. All any of you do is yell at each other. You are not friends. You're right. We're family. We leave no one behind. And the Infinity Saga even ends with this new found family coming together for Tony Stark's funeral, which will pay off with Downey Doom in ways we'll talk about in just a bit. So Doug, what do you think about all this? Doug. Am I interrupting your day here? What's going on? Oh, no, sorry, person. I just, I just got caught doom scrolling on my phone again. And I never even look at anything fun. I just get on there to get on there. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, man. I used to doom scroll all the time, but not anymore. Or because you set your phone on fire? Let's set all the phones on fire! No, no, no. I just started using my time better when I was on my phone by taking short math and science lessons with Brilliant. They're the sponsor of this video. Brilliant's great. I spend about 15 minutes a day relaxing and doing math and science lessons to sharpen my brain, which I never thought I would do, but it turns Turns out it's a lot of fun and it's become an important part of my morning routine. Oh, but I failed math and science in school because I'm just a big dum-dum. No, you're not a dum-dum and I was also a terrible math and science student in school. But, you know, I've grown up now and I feel like I missed out by not paying more attention. I mean, I'm really curious about how the world around me works. I don't want to just take things for granted and I want to keep learning. You see, math and science are hard, but if you can learn those subjects and you can learn anything, and learning is a lifelong skill. Brilliant helps you to learn something new every day, like computer science, science, or math. You'll learn to understand big things like terraforming Mars or regular household items like how your plumbing works. I wish I had these kinds of lessons when I was in school because instead of a teacher droning on and on, Brilliant builds your understanding with hands-on problem solving. And this method is proven to work six times better than just watching lecture videos. These lessons let you play with these concepts from the ground up. Plus, these lessons were created by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, Google, and more. 
more. And I never feel like Brilliant is something I have to do. I look forward to these lessons every single day. That's because Brilliant cultivates a simple daily learning habit with short, fun lessons. Plus, Brilliant has just launched new featured content that has helped me a lot in my job. They have lessons in how to examine data and modeling with multiple variables. And I'm telling you guys, I run a YouTube channel, so I have a lot of data to sort through. Brilliant has made me better at my job with these short, fun, easy lessons. So to try everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash screen crush or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription when you click the link below. Now back to what I was saying. So this brings us to the multiverse saga's theme of choice. Like I said earlier, it didn't seem like the multiverse saga had a strong through line at first. Phase four films were focused on grief and new beginnings, but there is an overarching idea throughout all of these projects that is closely linked to the concept of the multiverse. Multiverse. Again, I'm talking about choice. Loki season one makes it clear that the multiverse and its branching timelines are created simply by a character choosing to walk a different path. Stepping off your path created a nexus event, which left unchecked could branch off into madness. This is what separates the Marvel multiverse from, say, DC's. In DC Comics, there are just many, many, many different parallel Earths. But the root of Marvel's multiverse is the comic book What If? And in every issue, the writers play with a different premise stemming from choice. What if Spider-Man joined the Fantastic Four? What if the Punisher killed Daredevil? And so on. So let's go through each multiverse saga project and explain how they all revolve around this theme of choice. Now, guys, this may feel a little like listy at some points, but trust me, it's going to be worth it because then it's going to be clear exactly how this is all leading up to Robert Downey Jr. as Doctor Doom. So Loki was not the first entry in the multiverse saga, but it probably should have been. This show laid out all of the themes for this entire decade of films shows. Loki is a character who never fit in within Asgardian society. He played the role of a villain to essentially get attention for himself. I don't enjoy hurting people. It's the cruel, elaborate trick conjured by the weak to inspire fear. Loki then spends the entire series rebelling against the order that's been imposed by the Timekeepers, aka He Who Remains. Loki is an agent of chaos who is fighting against the ultimate order. Or, put another way, Loki is an agent of free will who is fighting against the concept of determinism. He Who Remains wants to eradicate free will by erasing the consequences of free will. For instance, if somebody changes their path and inadvertently creates a new universe, then the TVA would step in and erase that universe and the person's choices. So this story set up that the entire saga would be about the heroes fighting for the freedom to choose against the anti-choice order imposed by Kang the Conqueror. Loki season two continued this theme with Loki choosing to forgo his own happiness to save his friends, thus allowing the multiverse the freedom to choose their own paths. Which again is the perfect setup for Robert Downey Jr. to play Doctor Doom. I'm actually now really excited about this casting, which is why we made this Doom parody shirt and somehow Robert Downey Return shirts for sale at our merch store. You can find links for these and many more below. We've got lots of fun X-Men and Deadpool parody merch. We love designing these shirts for you guys and it really does help our channel. Like I said, the links are below. So now let's go through every Every single project of the multiverse saga and explain why choice was the theme of the story. And then we're going to talk about how all those threads are going to come together in Avengers Secret Wars with Robert Downey Jr. as Doctor Doom. So in WandaVision, Wanda was so overcome with grief that she no longer wanted to make any choices in her own life. So she cast a spell that robbed all choice from the people of Westview and took choice away from herself. She was able to disappear into a sitcom world where the plot lines were already written for her. Remember, early in the season, Wanda didn't seem to have any memory of her life before the Hex. And the show's resolution is when Wanda finally chooses to face her grief and to make decisions to live her own life. In Black Widow, Natasha is fighting an enemy who brainwashes women like her, a villain who essentially robs these women of their choices. The brainwashing is a metaphor for the child trafficking that we see in the film's opening credits. And we see that Dracov even robs robbed his own daughter of the ability to choose, and the film ends with Natasha and the others freeing the women from their mind control. But since the movie technically takes place during the multiverse saga, there's also a strong theme of found family in there as well. In Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Sam spends five episodes grappling with the choice to become Captain America. Initially, he declines under the weight of Steve's legacy and the reality of being a black man in America who wears an American flag. They will never let a black man be Captain America.
Sam then suffers the consequences of that choice when he sees how others like John Walker would abuse this power. And Bucky spends the entire series coping with the years when he had no choice in his actions, and he has to choose to forgive himself in the present day. Hawkeye is about Clint dealing with the repercussions of his choices during the blip, when he became a murderous vigilante called Ronan. The choices he made then are now placing innocent people in danger, like his family and Kate Bishop. So the series is about him making amends for his actions. During the blip, Clint felt like he had no choice. Vengeance and pain were all that mattered. And now, in the present day, Maya feels the same way. Her entire life is guided by a desire for vengeance until Clint lets her know that she still has a choice. You and I were the same. In Shang-Chi, the entire movie happens because Shang chooses to not allow his dad to choose his life for him. Much like he who remains, Wen Wu has already planned out his son's future. He will take over the Ten Rings and rule his dad's empire. But Shan chooses a new path for himself and a new name. But as we talked about in this video, the movie is also concerned with the central theme of balance. Shang-Chi learned the dark side of violence with his father, but then his mother's people showed him a different form of combat, where you redirect violence instead of encourage. It. So, in the end, he chooses to embrace the teachings of Ta Lo and claims the Ten Rings for himself. God, I really wish they would have made a sequel to that. The movie's really good. Well, yeah, but what about the Eternals? That's just space robots, right? Oh no, choice is 100% at the center of the Eternals. I mean, think about it. These space robots have been taught a lie for their entire lives. That the Celestials sent them to protect the Earth from the Deviants, and that they're from a planet called Olympia. There is no Olympia. What? When they learn that their gods have been lying to them for thousands of years, they are all faced with a choice. Do they allow the emergence to happen, or do they turn against their gods? The story follows a kind of Blues Brothers recruitment where each character is given the choice of whether or not to rejoin the others. Then, there's a real moral dilemma in this movie. By saving the Earth, they save billions of lives, but by birthing a celestial, they could potentially be creating trillions of lives. Make a decision! Well, it's tricky! You... And... To the movie's credit, not every hero comes around and chooses the good side. Kingo, Icarus, and Sprite choose to not go against the Celestials. Well, at least at first. And then there's the show What If. I mean, every episode is literally about the consequences stemming from different choices. There. That's the moment that created a new universe. But the final episodes of season one deal with the Watcher facing a choice of his own. Does he continue to observe, or does he choose to interfere? I observe all that transpires here, but I do not, cannot, will not interfere. And there's Spider-Man No Way Home. This movie deals with the aftermath of Far From Home when Mysterio essentially stole Peter's life choices from him. Spider-Man's name is Peter Parker. Peter can no longer choose the kind of life he wants, and he seeks out Doctor Strange's help to restore his ability to choose. And after the spell is botched, Peter makes the controversial choice to help the villains. The way he sees it, they're like him. Each of them has had their ability to choose taken from them. Norman was driven insane by a serum, Otto is being controlled by his arms, and the rest are all victims of experiments that have taken away their humanity in some way. Except Electro. I'm still not sure what to think about their version of Electro. No Way Home is also when Aunt May utters the most famous line in the Spider-Man mythos. And with great power, there must also come great responsibility. And that line is all about choice. In the comics, Peter could have chosen to become a celebrity and a rich wrestler, or he could have chosen poverty in the life of a hero. And in this movie, Peter's efforts to save the villains are rewarded with suffering. But then he has to make the choice to do the right thing anyways. And in the film's climax, he has to choose to not kill Norman Osborn. This movie is about Peter Parker choosing what kind of man he wants to be. And of course, the movie ends with him making an even greater sacrifice. He chooses to not re-meet his friends in order to keep them safe. And then there's Moon Knight. This is a show about a character who has no true agency, even within his own mind and body. Steven has chosen the life of a humble museum worker, but when he sleeps, an entirely different identity makes other decisions for him. The show is about Steven and later Mark trying to regain their ability to choose how they live their lives. But in addition to suffering from DID, Mark also made this bargain with Khonshu, trading his life and free will in exchange for service to the Egyptian god. I mean, there are really two villains in this series. First, there's the Egyptian god Amit, who wants to weigh everyone's worth to determine if they should survive. Essentially, this is saying that everyone is either good or bad, and their choices don't matter. Amit will light the path to good by eradicating the choice of evil. And the other villain is Khonshu himself. The show ends with Khonshu agreeing to free Mark and Steven from their vow. But in a twist, it's revealed that they were never free because there is a third personality that truly loves killing. Like Amit, Khonshu has robbed 
robbed these men of their ability to choose. Your mom likes to choose. Dude, that's kind of a weak one. Kind of weak? Fine. You know what? I'm quitting. And I'm going to move to Oregon and live with my dad. And then I'm going to make friends with a diverse and eclectic bunch of kids. And then these rich guys are going to come for the country club and they're going to say, we're going to destroy your town and build a golf course. And I'm going to be like, no, you're not. And then me and all my friends are going to get together. We go find the treasure map or we go find this restaurant that these mean people are running. And then we go find the treasure. And then there's a water slide and the mean people chase us. And then there's this guy who likes baby roots who thinks he's Superman. And then, and then, and then, and then, uh, never mind. I forgive you. All right, so this brings us to Multiverse of Madness, which is about Stephen Strange grappling with the life choices that he has made. The movie begins with people second guessing Stephen's choices and allowing the blip to occur. Remember, Stephen saw the consequences of 14 million different choices he could have made. And then this movie uses the idea of a multiverse to explore this central question. Was there ever a way Stephen Strange could have made choices that would allow him to be happy? In different realities, we see the consequences of Strange's different decisions. The movie opens with him choosing to betray America Chavez. In the 838 universe, we learned that Defender Strange chose to use the Darkhold and destroyed an entire universe. We also see the reality of Sinister Strange, who was driven insane by his lack of happiness, so he destroyed his own universe. The climax of the movie happens when Strange realizes that he cannot control everything in his life. So, he gives America Chavez the freedom of choice. And she doesn't defeat Wanda by slinging energy beams at her. She simply presents Wanda with new information so then Wanda can choose a different path for herself. Ms. Marvel is all about a young girl who is having an identity crisis, literal and metaphorical. As a Daisy teenager growing up in America, Kamala feels out of place at school and in the mosque. Her desire to enjoy Western things clashes with her parents' conservative sensibilities. And, like Doctor Strange, she ends up winning the day by convincing convincing the villains to make different choices. Kamran learns to channel his powers in a non-violent way, and Najma chooses to sacrifice herself to save Kamala's reality from destruction. But those are just the external conflicts. Kamala's inner identity crisis is resolved when she tells her family about her double identity, and her mother responds by creating a superhero costume that honors Eastern traditions. And finally, when Bruno tells her that she's a mutant, she replies, Whatever it is, it's just gonna be another label because Kamala is done letting the world choose who she is, and she just wants to be herself. Guys, whew, we're not even through phase four, but don't worry, we are getting there. In Thor Love and Thunder, Jane becomes Thor, but every time she chooses to use her powers, it kills her faster, and yet she makes the choice to keep going because it's the right thing to do. It's your choice, Jane. Thor also chooses to overcome his fear of loss and intimacy to be with her, although that is all pretty standard superhero stuff, but choice really comes into play in the climax. Just like in Multiverse of Madness, the villain is not defeated in combat. They're simply given a choice, and they choose mercy over vengeance. I choose love. You can too. You can bring her back. And then in She-Hulk, Jennifer Walters feels like she has no agency in her own life. Even before becoming She-Hulk, she was subjected to sexism that blocked her career advancement. And after becoming She-Hulk, the world tells her who she is. Her cousin tries to tell her that she should be a hero. Someone else gives her the name She-Hulk. This chick, pretty decent, turned into a Hulk. Like, like a chick Hulk. A she Hulk? And then Titania claims the name, so Jen has to go to court to fight for a name she doesn't even want. And then, trolls shape her public image by releasing her private information online. So the controversial ending of She-Hawk is all about Jen finally taking control of her own life, and literally getting to choose her own ending. You do not get to choose. Why not? It's my show. Black Panther Wakanda Forever is a movie that is all about choice. The plot is driven by Shuri choosing to not hand over Riri to the Talokan. And in the climactic battle, once again, Shuri is forced to choose between mercy and vengeance. And then she and the movie's villain each choose peace. Then in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, choice is once again at the center of this conflict. Scott chooses to help Kang to save his daughter's life. And then he is thrust into the middle of a multiversal engine that is powered by probability. In other words, this device is powered by choice. The movie is about Scott actually choosing to be a hero and not choosing to be a hero to save his daughter or to help his girlfriend or to help Captain America. For the first time, Scott chooses to do the right thing simply because it's the right thing to do. In Guardians of the Galaxy 3, the High Evolutionary is the perfect villain to face off against this band of misfits because he is trying to create a perfect society. But these perfect societies are always undone by free will. So he's trying to create a new race that is 
docile and completely subservient to him. In other words, a society that is free from choice. The Guardians, being misfits and iconoclasts, are the antithesis of this. They've always embraced the freedom to be weird. But, you know, like, like good weird. Secret Invasion grapples with the consequences of Fury's choice to use the scrolls as weapons instead of finding them a home. I think. It's kind of confusing. But this is also similar to the Marvels, where Carol is dealing with the fallout of her choice to kill the Supreme Intelligence. And, remember, the Supreme Intelligence controlled every facet of Kree society, essentially robbing the Kree of any choice in who they became. Therefore, this movie is about Carol restoring the power of choice to the Kree people. Alright, we're almost done. Echo was cut to ribbons in post, but ultimately it's about Maya choosing her Choctaw heritage over Wilson Fisk and a life of crime. In X-Men 97, characters are constantly faced with life-altering dilemmas. Magneto chooses to lead the X-Men, and there are many other choices in the show that I will not spoil in case you haven't seen it. It's that good. I just can't spoil it. You should watch it. It's great. And finally, Deadpool and Wolverine begins with Wade's choice to defy the TVA and save his universe, while Paradox essentially seeks to remove people's option to choose by pruning them into the void. Meanwhile, worst Wolverine has to choose to help Wade and sacrifice his own life to save the universe. Yeah, but, you know, that's all pretty standard stuff. Don't heroes always have to make choices like that? Oh yeah, a lot of movies, especially superhero movies, hinge on choices like this. Good storytelling often puts characters into positions where they have to make impossible choices. Like in The Dark Knight, Batman chooses mass surveillance to find the Joker. But the difference between the multiverse saga and other action and genre films and shows is that choice is at the center of these stories. Whereas, like, the Fast and Furious movies or Indiana Jones films don't really hinge on one of the characters making a decision. And this theme of choice really does boil down to the simple question. What if? What if I hadn't lost that scholarship? What if I quit my job? What if I hadn't been dumped by the Beatles? Tough break, Randy. And this is where Robert Downey Jr.'s casting could be perfect. So let's assume that he is playing Doctor Doom as a variant of Tony Stark. And he's not like the literal Victor Von Doom of the Latvian Romani people. There are clear parallels between Tony Stark and Victor Von Doom. They're both tech genius geniuses. They love wearing armor, and they want to make the world a better place. Victor Von Doom believes that the only way to fix the world is if he were to rule it, and Tony Stark has a similar massive ego. At many points in the Infinity Saga, Tony's ego drove him to push away others. But I did you a big favor. I have successfully privatized world peace. Also to behave unilaterally. I don't want to hear the man was not meant to meddle medley. And also to create murder bots to protect the world from itself. I see a suit of armor around the that's all very Doctor Doom-like behavior. So if the multiverse saga is about this theme of choice, then it's really about what makes us who we are. Are we born a certain way? Are we destined to become evil or good? Or are we the sum total of our life choices? Can you measure a hero based on the good they choose to do? Or should you judge a hero based on the evil choices they could have made, but then they went another way? The MCU's Infinity Saga culminated in a funeral for Tony Stark, where his found family honored him as a hero. So it would be fitting if the multiverse saga showed us how Tony's choices would have led him to a more villainous end. And maybe, just as Tony snapped to save the universe in Endgame, Doom Tony could sacrifice himself for the greater good once again. This would show us that, no matter how awful his life went at his core, Tony Stark is always a hero. But guys, that's just what we think about the theme of the multiverse saga. Do you think we're reaching? Is there a different theme that we didn't discuss? Do you think that Robert Downey Doom is a good idea? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.